Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of life. Uh, we now ask that you grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit as we take up this study, um, that you will bind these things we're looking at together into a um, cohesive message that we can understand uh, the light that you have for us at this time. Please pour your latter rain out upon us. I take control of my words and prepare the hearts and minds of the brothers and sisters that are hearing these things to receive the message you have for us at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Portola, California, not this Sabbath, but the following Friday night and Sabbath. And we are planning on going back to Africa for meetings in April, but we're, we're considering instead of Odilio and Stephen and myself going back to Africa, just sending someone like Clayton or some other person like Clayton there and setting up one of these um, seminar chats where you stay in your home country, the speaker, and you broadcast it to a group wherever they be. And that way, if, if one person went to Africa and set it up at this country, you could have meetings. It allows the people at the meetings to interact real time with the people that are speaking. Um, I could do some presentations. Uh, then we could flip it to, to say, Holland and Stephen and Odilio could do some presentations. And while you're doing the presentations, the group in Africa can ask questions, interact. And you do that for a couple days. Then the technical person moves to the next country, does the same thing. It allows the message to be taught, questions and answers to be handled. Um, so we're, we're at least considering that. Um, so where I, where I was ending up, I'm trying to put some things in place to, to address Daniel 11, 40, 45, and how Daniel 11, Daniel 10, 11, and 12 all come into Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And there's a handful of old truths, truths that we taught for many years that I'm refreshing us of before we do that so that we understand the point of reference um, for these things. And I, my intent is to remind us at the outset of these presentations until it becomes familiar with the four lines that are in Daniel chapter 11 that will be themes that you can find in verses 40 to 45. It's about four kingdoms. The kingdom of the, the beast, Catholicism, the kingdom of the dragon, the United Nations, spiritualism, the kingdom of the false prophet, apostate, Protestantism, the United States, and then the kingdom of the 144,000. Um, I've identified that based upon Daniel 2 and 4 and Gideon going down and hearing the dream and the interpretation thereof, that in Daniel 2 and 4, at least three things can be derived from that light. That being that Daniel 2 is about the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. And in Daniel 2, you, you have these final kingdoms of Bible prophecy represented down there in the feet and the toes. And you have the, the rock that's cut out without hands that is the kingdom of the 144,000. So Daniel 2, when Gideon goes down and hears the dream and the interpretation thereof, there's an emphasis that what empowers Gideon is this revelation. And then in Daniel 4, it's not about the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, it's about the kings. So we have this story of the popes um, in the beast, the kingdom of the beast. We have the story of the king of the south in the uh, kingdom of the dragon. And we have the story of the presidents um, in the kingdom of apostate Protestantism. And we have the story of the, the old movement and the new... Omega movement in the kingdom of the um, 144,000, the two classes that are in there that get um, separated out. Um, one of the things I would point out as we go on, as we consider this, is the story of the dragon to me is, and when I get to this point to really deal with it, I'm going to bring a book that I used to use all the time, um, Keys of This Blood. And one of the reasons I'd use this book is that Malachi Martin, who wrote this book before the collapse of the Soviet Union, his intro to the book, and I, and I even think it's a, 
a subtitle. It's keys of this blood, and then it's got like a paragraph that's a subtitle. And I can't quote the subtitle perfectly, but it's, the subtitle is about a three-way struggle between Catholicism, the Soviet Union, and the United States to take control of the world. And it's like the Catholic mirror of the great controversy, that book. It's telling the same story. Um, but in it, you can see this struggle for the rulership of the world, which Malachi Martin says Catholicism is going to win. But in Daniel 11, verse 40, you see the king of the south um, attack the king of the north. Muchas gracias. Okay, this is Keys of, the, Keys of This Blood by Malachi Martin. And the subtitle is The Struggle for World Dominion Between Pope John Paul II, Michael Gorbachev, and the Capitalist West. Okay. That's the papacy, Russia, the Soviet Union, and the United States. There's other important, important pieces of information in here. And Malachi Martin was essentially the number one apologist for Pope John Paul II. Um, but I won't go there yet. I just, I, I will, Lord willing, I'll get to that when we're dealing with this struggle between the King of the South um, that begins... In 1798, as we understand it, I want to just show you something about this in advance. So when we get to it, it's our, you've already heard it more than once. If this is Daniel 11.41 here, uh, and this is verse 40, this is the history of verse 40. You would, if you go back, you'll see that Parminder lied. And I always wonder why he was doing this. One of his lies was, when he was dealing with verse 40, he says, we never, we never said anything after 1989. We just said 1989 and that's it. And I never did that. I always taught and understood that we were in this history, even though I would point to 1989 being fulfilled back here. He had a reason. You never know. I mean, sometimes you might know. You're not certain now as you look back on Parminder's lies what the purpose of those lies were. Um, and because you were giving him the benefit of the doubt... You never thought much, of about, much about him then. But in verse 40, you have 1798 and, 18, and 1989. Here, the king of the south prevails. And here, the king of the north prevails in, in the struggle. Okay? And what I'm saying is that this struggle between the, about the king of the south is about who's going to be the ruler of the dragon, the ruler of the king of the south, when it's all said and done, as this book says, the struggle for world dominion. Okay, And those people that are struggling to be the king of the south are struggling to be the head of the United Nations. Who's going to take control of the United Nations here at the threefold union? Okay, So this story is about a struggle between Putin, who is the king of the south, and Trump, who is not necessarily the king of the south, but there's a little bit of an echo. Uh, and I say that because the king of the south in 1798 was atheistic France, and atheistic France typifies the United States. They're both a two-horned power. They both put the papacy on the throne of the earth, and they both take the papacy off the throne of the earth. So even though technically Putin would be the king of the South right now and uh, Trump is apostate Protestantism, they're still struggling to be the leader of the king of the South, the United Nations here, even if they don't know it. I, I'm not, as human beings, I don't think they understand these things. But one of the things I want to show us here that we have spoke about in this history of the king of the South is that when it comes to Russia, Russia invades Afghanistan on December 25th, 1225, 1979. And Russia is going to, or the Soviet Union is going to begin to collapse on November 9th, 1989 at midnight with the bringing down of the Berlin Wall and it's going to finish its collapse on 
December 25th, 1991. So this is just two witnesses to December 25th. The December 25th is going to be down here as well at verse 41. Um, 12, 25, 20, 21. And there's other witnesses to, to December 25th that are associated with the Soviet Union, the dragon power. But what I want you to see here is in the demise of the Soviet Union, they had a 10-year... 10 year proxy war, and then a couple years here for the fall to be complete. And so, what we're seeing now is that there's another proxy war, a similar proxy war, that began in 2011, and 10 years would take you to 2021. And I'm saying the, the reason I'm putting this up here is this is just speaking to some of this story of the dragon, just to get it in our head as we proceed. And this proxy war in Afghanistan, the country was an Islamic country, and the two entities that were struggling against each other were the United States and Russia. Russia was in there actively, uh, but the United States was propping up bin Laden and the Taliban to, in this war. And here, it's the same players. It's Russia, the United States, in their struggle. It, it's wound down quite a bit, uh, but it did begin in 2011, and the United States is not out of there yet, um, even though Tess says they're out of there. They're not out of there yet. Uh, Tess gives, they give Tess a lot of room with her false historical application. But we're, we're saying that with the conclusion of the Soviet Union, in fulfillment of verse 40, 1989, that verse 40 begins with the struggle between the king of the south and the king of the north, and that it's going to conclude over here with a struggle, a two-step struggle with Raphia and Paneum. I'm going to put Paneum here just to make a point. Um, I'm not making any I'm not arguments about the distance between these waymarks. But here, the king of the south prevails, and here, the king of the north prevails. Please notice that that means in the history of, of verse 40, which begins in 1798, you have two prominent wars, one in 1798 that the king of the south wins, and then one in 1989 that the king of the north wins. And when you get to the end of the history of verse 40, you have two prominent wars. Raphia, the king of the south winds. Paneum, the king of the north winds. Jesus illustrates the end with the beginning. But in conjunction with this, in here, you've got this proxy war. This here is what I'm illustrating. And we got another proxy war going on here. Okay. So I want to show you one more proxy war. And this is from Millerite History. Um, this proxy war was in Afghanistan. Anyone want to spell Afghanistan for me? Is it AF? No. Yeah, yeah. Afghanistan? I'm just going to put Af. And this is in Syria. There is another proxy war that impacts our history that took place in Syria. And it was 10 years, but not really. It, it was two, two or three years at the beginning and two or three years at the end. And this is the first war, first war of Egypt versus the Ottomans. And it began, and the first battle, the first war, was 1831 to 1833. And the second war between Egypt and the Ottomans was, began in 1839 
and ended in 1841. So it's 10 years just like this proxy war and just like this proxy war, and it was a proxy war. Okay, it was a proxy war. Uh, the Ottomans, uh, this is, you just go into the history, they were, they were fighting a battle that was wider than simply an attempt to conquer this country, which was Syria, okay? It was groups of people. Here, Egypt wins first. The king of the south. Here, the king of the north wins. So this proxy war has the same elements as up here. First the king of the south, king of the north. First the king of the south, king of the north. Proxy war here for 10 years. Proxy war happening now for 10 years. Uh, this one was in Syria. This was in Syria. Okay. But this is in the Millerite history. And the Millerite history does what? Repeats to the very letter. So what I'm wanting to suggest here, but, and we'll try to deal with this as we proceed, is when we get to these three proxy wars, um, and when you have three of something, you usually have a triple application of prophecy. You can look at it that way. That this history here, 1839 to 1840, we already have a date in here that's of significance. That's right here, August 11th, 1840. And what is it, what date in our history are we saying was typified by August 11th, 1840? July 18th, 2020. Okay, two years before that event, we put in the public record that based upon our understanding of November 9th, that on July 18th, Something was going to happen, and, it, and it's grown, it's mushroomed into what we understand is going to happen on July 18th. So we're understanding that no one's believing what we're saying about Nashville on July 18th, 1840, the same way that no one's believing, believed what Josiah Litt said about 1840. But when the event takes place, then the Levites are going to join the Advent movement, the same way the 200,000 joined the Millerite movement on August 11th, 1840. And if that's the case, then what I would say is that this history here, 1841 here, what would it be typifying? Verse 41, the Sunday Law. This would be July 18th, this would be December 25th. Okay, so that's just a foretaste of this struggle of the king of the north and the king of the south for, to determine who's going to be the king of the south when the United Nations enters into the threefold union. Okay, um, But check this history out. Um, it's 10 years, just like the other proxy wars. It is a proxy war, but it's actually two wars. This, they, they call this the first war of Egypt versus the Ottoman Empire, and this is the second war of Egypt versus the Ottoman Empire, and the beginning to end, it's 10 years, and it's um, two years at the beginning, two years at the end, which seems very symmetrical, but prophetically, it, it's pretty provocative. Okay, so, um, this Keys of this Blood addresses this story here, Fatima. In this book, he's going to tell us that um, when Pope John Paul II was, when they attempted to assassinate him, that when he was recovering in his ho hotel, hospital room, that he himself saw the miracle of Fatima outside his window. And at that point, he knew that he was the good pope that the Fatima prophecy predicted. And from that point on, he began to travel the world, and the whole world wonders after the beast, and the Catholic Church uh, gets its biggest publicity promotion in its history, thus, being, thus corresponding to Augustus Caesar, the height of Roman, um, Romanism, uh, only to be followed by the current pope. Okay, so 
And of course, we can see what's going on with the Democrats and Republicans over the Constitution in the United States. That's happening as we speak. Um, and of course, these are pretty self-evident as well. So over here yesterday where I was heading to but never quite finished yesterday was, and I told, I told you the three things that I wanted to, to remind us of, so I'll start there. One of the things these, this line teaches us, and this isn't the only three lines. This is the, what we call the pattern of Christ. And Antichrist is governed by this pattern. And we're going to go into Revelation 11 and show that the Word of God, the Old and New Testament, are governed by this pattern. But this pattern occurs often. It's, I, I forget how many times, how many different lines we can illustrate under this pattern, but we only need two or three to establish it. So one of the things that this teaches us is that God never changes. There's no variableness. Uh, this Catholic dispensationalism that um, Parminder has introduced uh, falls apart with this here because this is the same history, the same sequ sequence of events in the time of Christ as in the time of Antichrist, as in the time of the French Revolution, as in the time of Moses and the time of Noah and the time of Elijah. It's it's all the same sequence of events. Um, and the way marks on these lines speak to each other. They're not totally, they're connected. They're, they're telling the same story. Um, so that's, that's part of what we wanted to, wanted to demonstrate here. The second thing we wanted to demonstrate by this is that it is acceptable to see a line that is identifying uh, a holy entity, Christ, and that an unholy entity, Satan, or the papacy, is still governed by that line. So that when we get over here and we, we say that Parminder and Tess begin their, their movement in this holy movement down here in 2013, this current pope was signed into office March 13, 2013. He's typifying the work of Parminder and Tess. Um, and when we look at... Their emphasis on politics, we can see their emphasis on politics in this line in the United States between CNN and Fox News. And uh, it's acceptable to see those unholy concepts be lined up with this holy movement as waymarks. As long as you rightly divide the word of truth, that, can be dem that type of application is justified by this old... Um, presentation that we did. And what was the third one? <laughs> uh, there was one other thing that I wanted to show and I put it in the record yesterday. Uh, pardon me? Yeah, well, that, that, this is the third one, but there was a third... Oh, the other third concept was is we use this to show uh, the time of the end is the end of a time prophecy. Okay, so, the, so we want to be familiar with our justification for marking the times of the end when we go into Daniel 11 and bring it into verse 40. But yes, the next thing we're going to do is the French Revolution. Let's go to Revelation 11. Verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Sister White is clear that these two witnesses are the Old and New Testament that we're going to continue to testify during the 1260 years of papal rule. Okay, and that's in the Great Controversy, but it's, it's in the Scriptures. Um, one of the main themes in the Scriptures, upon the testimony of two things established, and there's places where Sister White says, 
this is a paraphrase, Christ's miracles were proof of his divinity, but a greater proof of his, of his divinity was to take the history of the New Testament and line it up with the prophecies of the Old Testament. That's where the proof of his divinity is really found, is the fulfillment of prophecy in the New Testament, prophecies that were given in the Old Testament, because that's your two witnesses. Okay, so there's lots of characteristics of these two witnesses. Verse 4, there, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Who, who is that referring to? Because there's two witnesses here, and now, now John is using just some terminology. It's Elijah, and have power over waters to turn them to blood. That's Moses. Elijah and Moses are here being inferred by the, the, the verbiage of it all. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Okay, so how long are they going to give their testimony? We just read it. Okay, I'm going to put 3.5 years. Right? Uh, because that's also 42 months, 1260 years. But I'm just making it here. And their testimony, um, it's a little bit less specific, but we know that it's taking place from 538 to 1798. And I'm saying it's a little bit more obscure or vague. Because this attack against them is going to take place prior to 1798 in the French Revolutionary French Revolution time period. Um, but in any case, we have two witnesses here, the Old and New Testament. They give a testimony clothed in sackcloth for this period of time. And when they finish their testimony, what's going to happen to them? Happen to them. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, which Sister White identifies as atheistic France, is going to kill them. And this is right where this way mark is right where the papacy receives its deadly wound. And this is right where Christ is crucified. Okay, same way mark. Yes? Everyone with me? Um, and, and their dead bodies sh shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Was our Lord crucified in Sodom and Egypt? Yes and, no. yes and no. He was crucified in Jerusalem. Okay, so this is making sure that we understand that it lines up prophetically, uh, but it's, it's got more, it has more information um, for us to grapple with as students, students of prophecy. And verse 9 says, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the graves. And this is what I was saying yesterday. I've, I, in the past, I always struggled with this um, because Christ was in the grave three days. But these two prophets are in the graves three and a half days. So I didn't really, I never really did solve that for myself. But I knew that at the end of the three and a half days, they're going to be resurrected just like Christ was, and they're going to ascend just like he did. And then you're going to see the fall of Babylon right where it's supposed to be with the earthquake of the French Revolution. And then you're going to see the second coming illustrated. But now I'm thinking that we have the justification, probably the correct way to apply it, is the three and a half days takes us to A.D. 34. Um, and you have there, of course, the death of the Jewish church and the bringing to life of the Christian church, although you might argue, well, it wasn't really dead. Um, it was just created right then and there, the Christian church. But the three and a half years fits better in that regard. Um, 
verse 10, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three and a half, after three days and a half, the spirit of life entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. So here, they're being resurrected. And according to this pattern, the next thing that should happen is they should ascend. Um, and great fear fell upon them which saw them, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. So there's the ascension. And I'm saying that this may very well better fit 34 AD. And what I'm saying by that is that, I guess the way you would say it is that Christ had a wife that died, the Jewish church. But he has a wife that comes back to life right here, the Christian church. And now the Christian church is going to be lifted up to heaven. Okay, because and the Christian church is going to become an ensign that carries the gospel to the to the entire world, the New Testament says. So that's that's this ascending in heaven. The ascending into heaven is lifting up of an ensign. Um, that isn't how we've taught it in the past, but it sure makes this fit better. Because then you have 27, 31, and 34. And I'm not trying to force it to look better. But I don't mind being corrected along the way if I need to be. Uh, some people claim that they can make no mistakes. But if you claim to be infallible, what fruit is that? Catholic. It's Catholic teachings that there's human beings that are infallible. Which prophet in the Bible, other than Christ, didn't make mistakes. Which one? Perhaps Enoch. Maybe you could argue Enoch. But all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He came to the point where he had quit sinning. Yeah, he just came to the point where he had ceased to sin. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the other prophets, the prominent prophets, we have in the record mistakes they made. Moses struck that rock twice. Noah got drunk. Uh, John doubted Christ, John the Baptist. So anyway, infallibility, that's, that's Catholic. Um, when Parminder and Tess are saying that, that's just another evidence of them being representatives of the Catholic Church. Verse 13, And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and that earthquake, of course, being the French Revolution, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in that earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. So the tenth part of the city is because France was one of the ten nations of Europe that made up pagan Rome. France is the part that fell. It was the tenth, tenth part of that kingdom. A kingdom is a city in Bible prophecy. French Revolution, France fell. 7,000 of the nobility in France lost their heads over that whole situa situation. But the 7,000 probably um, is referring to um, our history. This is probably the midnight cry earthquake here. If you're bringing this down to our, our history, I'm not doing that yet. And the 7,000 would be speaking to the Levites. Um, so this earthquake of the French Revolution, Sister White speaks of the French Revolution illustrating the period of the seven last plagues, as was the destruction of Jerusalem, it speaks to the seven last plagues, and so is the fall of Babylon. When the Sunday law becomes universal, universal and the papacy is brought down, human probation closes, seven last plagues, seven last plagues, seven last plagues, leads to the second coming of Christ, John at Patmos, uh, and the actual second coming in the history of the papacy. And then here, the third woe, and the pioneers taught that the third woe um, 
went to this, the second coming, and uh, let's read it first. Verse 14, the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Pioneers will tell you the third woe go all the way to the second coming. But even if you want to argue their application, the third woe is the seventh trumpet, and the trumpets line up with the seven last plagues. Therefore, the third woe is the seventh plague, the final plague that takes place at the second coming. You follow that logic? Okay, so this pattern, same as this pattern, same as this pattern, same as other patterns, there is no shadow of turning, no variableness with Jesus because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is God. He changes not. So we've used this to, to show that, that this Catholic dispensationalism is not part of this movement. Um, we've used it to identify ta the time of the end. Um, this is a time of the end, 538. This is a time of the end, 1798, because this is an end of a 30-year prophecy. Um, this is the end of a prophecy of 69 weeks. This is the end of a prophecy of 1260 days. This is the end of a prophecy of 1260 days. So these waymarks have to be approached carefully when you're looking at the time of the end. And the third thing I was trying to show by that was, this is your test question. I've already repeated it once here today. A time of the end, I just went over. Time of the end, Christ does not change. That's the time of the end. Okay, it's in the record. It's in the record. Even if I forgot it, just back up your video a little bit. Let's move on to Isaiah 23. The reason that I want to move on to Isaiah 23 is because of, those, of that history over there. Okay, so I'm going to move this line of Isaiah 23 up to the top because it, this is many things, Isaiah 23. This is this line, Isaiah 23. This is 1798. And this is the Sunday law. This is Isaiah 23. This is the history of the USA. This is the history of Adventism. I mean, Adventism goes on beyond here, but Adventism will have finished its judgment by the time it gets here. Okay, this is the history of Adventism. What else is this the history of? It's the history of Babylon. What else? This is the history of the time of God's people in Egypt. I don't know exactly how to express. It's not the whole history of Egypt, but there was a time that God's people were in Egypt, and it's this history here as well. Okay? So these, these three primary lines, the one in the middle, are the ones that we really deal with. Um, Babylon had God's people in this would be the Babylon had God's people in captivity for 70 years. But Sister White says that 70 years represented the 1260. So this is a 70 year period, and it's a 1260 year period. And I'm going to say it's a 400-year period. Why am I saying it's a 400-year period? Because of the prophecy of Abraham in Genesis 15. You can say 400 or 430 if you like, but you get my point. Um, and all of these lines of truth, line upon line, are...
Verse 40. This is Daniel 11, verse 40. That begins in 1798 and ends at the Sunday Law, verse 41. So when we're bringing the prophecy of Daniel's last vision into the last six verses of Daniel 11, we need to see these lines of prophecy in this history, and it's these lines of prophecy that will be our point of reference for sorting out those four kingdoms over there. Okay, but I want to begin with Isaiah 23, because one of the things we have to understand about this history of verse 40 is that during this history, the papacy is hidden, although Isaiah 23 is going to say forgotten. She's behind the scenes. So let's go to Isaiah 23 and remind ourselves of this old presentation. Um, don't know that it's the case all over the world, but in Africa, when I was there, I sensed that many of those people there are unfamiliar with the old truths from 1989 to 9-11. And maybe that isn't the case of those of us that are here in the United States, but those of us that are here in the United States are few and far between. There is not very many of us. So um, we're talking about uh, places like Africa, South America, Asia, that need to come to grips with this message. And it uh, seems like the majority of them that are willing to consider this message are unfamiliar with things that became standard understanding years ago. And one of them was Isaiah 23 when we began to look at Islam. And in verse 1 of Isaiah 23, and what does, what does 23 mean? Pardon me? Oh, Closed door. Yeah. 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Probably more than that, but when you see a 23, it's closed door, and this is going to take you right to the closed door in this story. The word burden means prophecy. The burden of Tyre. How ye ships of Tarshish, for it is laid waste, so that there is no house, no entering in from the land of Kittim, it is revealed to them. So the prophecy of Tyre. First, let's find out who Tyre is in this passage. Um, and... He, This is kind of a, a difficult history if you go in and look at what this, when Isaiah was dealing with this history in the days that he lived, it's kind of a tricky one. And uh, Theodore does it very well. So those of you that are familiar with this history of Tyre um, know that I'm not disagreeing with Theodore, but I'm taking this simply at the prophetic application. And the prophetic application is really easy to see. Okay, So if you go to Let's start with verse 14. Let's start with verse 13. Behold the land of the Chaldeans. This people was not till the Assyrian founded it for them that dwell in the wilderness. They set up their towers thereof, and they raised up their palaces thereof, and he brought it to ruin. What I want you to see here, Behold the land of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are the religious elite of Babylon. Okay, this is a reference to Babylon. And uh, it's saying that it was founded by the Assyrian, the king of the north. This is a reference to the king of the north. And it's, it's about his image, so to speak, because when it talks about the Assyrian setting up the Chaldean religion, because the Chalde Chaldeans were the priesthood, they set up towers. And what's a tower in Bible prophecy? It's a church. Okay, and they set up palaces. What's a palace? It's a state. Okay, so when the Assyrian, the king of the north, set up the Chaldean religion, the structure was the combination of church and state, which is a theme throughout the scriptures. And he brought it to ruin, verse 13. Verse 14 says, How ye ships of Tarshish, for your strength is laid waste. 
and old study for us. Um, what are the ships? Of, what are ships? Let's start there. What are ships according to Daniel 11, verse 40, when the Lord first started instructing us? Economics. Economics. What are the ships of Tarshish? Close, but no cigar. What are the ships of Tarshish? They are the premier economic ship. How many ships, economic ships are there in Ezekiel? And I'd have to look for the chapter. How many ships, economic ships are mentioned? There are ten. But the premier ship was the ships of Tarshish. So who is the ships of Tarshish? The United States. Okay. And when the, now, now, Larry, I have a question for you. When everyone howls over the ships of Tarshish, why are they howling? Islam. Islam has hit the economic stability of the United States. So that's part of the story in this, in this burden, this prophecy of Tyre. But we haven't identified yet who is Tyre. Next verse, verse 15. And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten seventy years according to the days of one king. And what does Daniel tell Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2? He says, and Thou, O king, are the head of gold. Okay, a king is a kingdom. Okay, so thou, thou shalt be forgotten 70 years according to the days of one kingdom. Is there a kingdom in Bible prophecy that ruled for 70 years? Babylon. Babylon. Okay, so we've already put prophets and kings, page 714 in the record a couple presentations ago. Prophets and kings, page 714. Sister White compares the 70 years of captivity in literal Babylon by literal Israel to the 1260 years of cap spiritual captivity of spiritual Israel in spiritual Babylon. So the days of one king is the days of Babylon. Um, and at the end of the 70 years, Tyre shall sing as a harlot. Okay, so whoever Tyre is, she's a harlot. And at the end of the 70 years, she's going to sing. And when Sister White, Brother Daniel's doing a presentation on the song of Moses and the Lamb right now. And Sister White tells us what their song is, the song of the 144,000. What is the song of the 144,000, according to Ellen White? Song of victory. I mean, you know, you're defining the definition of the song, but what is... I'll just say, she says it's their experience. Yeah. Okay, it's their, the song, a song is a, a symbol of the experience. Okay, so past she, and present. Past, future. past, future. Here, her experience is she is a harlot. Okay, a tire is a harlot. Who's the harlot of Bible prophecy? Papacy, Papacy. Jezebel. Okay, verse 16. Take a harp, go about the city, a city in Bible prophecy is a kingdom. On several witnesses, look at uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation. There's probably eight witnesses to a city being a kingdom. Um, Take a harp and go about the kingdom. Thou harlot that has been forgotten, make sweet melody, sing many songs that thou mayest be remembered. And it shall come to pass after the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre and she shall turn to her hire and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. Who is it that commits fornication with all the kings of the earth? It's a papacy. When does she do so? At the Sunday law, at the threefold union. So she does so at the end of 70 years which is the days of one kingdom, one king. The Sunday law is the end of one kingdom. What kingdom is it? It's the kingdom, the sixth kingdom. It's the kingdom of the United States. Okay, so that history up there is the history of 
70 years, it's the history of the United States, and this is telling us during that history, from 1798 until the Sunday Law, from the time period when the papacy received its deadly wound until the deadly wound is healed, that the papacy is what? It's forgotten. It's, it's there, though, but it's forgotten. And, and when we used to think this, it was so easy to see. So, so many passages in the Spirit of Prophecy about how the Protestants have forgot the papacy and the cruelty and the, the lies of past history. But who would have thought that people that profess to be in this movement would have forgotten the papacy? Who would have thought that people in this movement could listen to Parminder and Tess uplift the Jesuit order? Who would have forgot, thought that people in this movement could have forgotten what the Jesuit order was all about? Not me. I didn't think it. I, I thought this was to the Protestant world. I thought it was to Adventism. I could see how Adventism had forgotten the papacy because they started in the 30s accepting papal doctrines and papal uh, theological techniques. And then they started giving medals to the Pope of Rome. Um, then they joined the World Council of Churches as full voting members. So I could see how the Adventist church had forgotten the papacy, but who would have thought people in this movement would have forgotten? But anyway, she's forgotten until when? Until the Sunday Law. Verse 18, And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to the Lord. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. Okay, so... What I'm saying here is in this history, which is the history of verse 40, based upon Isaiah 23, that the papacy is behind the scenes. It's, that's what it means by forgotten. It's hidden. Do we have a second witness to that story? Yes, we have the story of Elijah. Story of Elijah, Jezebel is off in Samaria. She's nowhere to be found in the story of Elijah, but she's the one there pulling the strings of the priests of the grove and the prophets of Baal. Were you going to add another witness? Uh, Herod and uh, yeah. John, John the Baptist. The, the second witness to the story of Elijah is Herod and Herodias. Um, Salome's there doing the dance of deception and on Herod's birthday, but Herodias isn't there. When Herod asks Salome, what can I give you for this wonderful dance? Salome has to return to her mother's place to get the answer. I want John the Baptist's head in a charger. So in this history, the papacy is hidden, and I'm saying that we have to understand that to, un to rightly understand the struggles that go on here and here and even here, that this, this has to be in place, an anchor as we approach these histories. It, what the papacy is doing, it's doing behind the scenes. Okay, um, six minutes. I now have, if you have the handout from today, I didn't put a title on it, on the handout. Um, these are some concepts that must be in place as we start going through Daniel 11, 40 to 45 in the context of Daniel's last vision. There are, they are various concepts. They're all familiar to everyone in this room, probably, and many of you that are watching. So rather than do two presentations a day, I can go a little bit long, right? I mean, you have the memory on your camera and stuff. So these... Let's walk through these quotes and put them in the record. The first one, I'll explain why I think they're important when we go when I, after I read them. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 451 and onward. The decree which is to go forth against the people of God will be very similar to that issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews in the time of Esther. Okay. Um, next paragraph. I want us to see that Ellen White 
does not have this Catholic concept of dispensationalism that has been promoted. She's saying that the history of Esther is similar to our history, and the decree of Ahasuerus is the Sunday Law decree. She, she teaches, the Bible teaches, and we've always believed in this movement, that all of these histories are speaking to the final history, and they all agree with one another. Um, they're not strictly revelations for that particular point in history, um, and so on and so forth. Second paragraph. The same masterful mind that plotted against the faithful in ages past is still seeking to rid the earth of those who fear God and obey His law. Satan will excite, excite indignation against the humble minority who conscientiously refuse to accept popular customs and traditions. You always want to be in the minority. Okay, when, when this movement split, if you had no other point of reference, to make your choice where you want to stand, that there would have put you on the right side of the issue. Many are called, but will be lost. Few are chosen and will be saved. Okay, you want to be in the minority. The only time you didn't want to be in the minority is if you were an angel in heaven during that rebellion. The minority was kicked out, but that's it. The majority stayed. Men of position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile to take counsel against the people of God. The vile is Tiberius. The vile is the current pope. Those people that are upholding the current pope, such as Parmender and Tesdu, are the category of the vile. Wealth, genius, education will combine to cover them with contempt. Persecuting rulers, ministers, and church members will conspire against them. With pen and voice, by boasts, threats, and ridicule, they will seek to overthrow their faith. By false representations and angry appeals, they will stir up the passions of the people. Not having a thus saith the scriptures. Why don't they have a thus saith the scriptures? Because they say to use a thus saith the scriptures is spiritualism and you shouldn't do it. Not having a thus saith the scriptures to bring against the advocates of the Bible Sabbath, they will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack. To secure po popularity and patronage, legis legislators will yield to the demand for a Sunday law. There's going to be a Sunday law. Those who fear God cannot accept an institution that violates a precept of the Decalogue. On this battlefield comes the last great conflict of the controversy between truth and error. And we're not left in doubt as to the issue. Now, as in the days of Mordecai, the Lord will vindicate His truth and His people. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy and the violation of the law of God, and this is not some kind of decree about minority rights. It's about Sabbath and Sunday, that's what she's speaking about in the previous paragraph. There's no way to rest that into some kind of minority rights enactment. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand with the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp, the hands, clasp hands with spiritualism, when, under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, that's its two horns, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then, when she shall do this, then, we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Remember that. Threefold union is when the decree is passed and when the decree is passed, among other things, the marvelous working of Satan begins. Okay, other things begin there. National apostasy is followed by national ruin. But please note that. Please note the threefold union is at the Sunday law. When the decree goes forth, all three hands are joined. As the approach of the Roman armies was assigned to the disciples of the impending destruction of Jerusalem, so may this apostasy be assigned to us that the limits of God's forbearance is reached, 
that the measure of our nation's iniquity is full, and that the angel of mercy is about to take her flight, never to return. The people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress which prophets have described as the time of Jacob's trouble. So what is she saying here? She's saying the Sunday law in the United States is a sign that probation is about to close, and when it closes, then the time of Jacob's trouble begins. She's not saying the time of Jacob's trouble begins at the Sunday law. She's saying the Sunday law is the sign of, that was put in place by the Romans when they came to conquer Jerusalem. Uh, they put the banners of their authority inside the sacred precincts. This was a sign for the Christians to flee. Later they come and they destroy Jerusalem. So the Sunday law is the sign that the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy is finished. There is still a period of time, one hour, that the Nethanims come out of Babylon and join with God's people. When that's all over, then the time of Jacob's trouble begins. But she's talking about Jacob's trouble now. She says, The cries of the faithful persecuted ones ascend to heaven. And as the blood of Abel cried from the ground, there are voices also crying to God from martyrs' graves, from the sepulchres of the sea, the mountain caverns, from convent vaults. How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The Lord is doing his work. All heaven is astir. The judge of all earth is soon to arise and vindicate his insulted authority. The mark of deliverance will be set upon the men who keep God's commandments, who revere his law, and who refuse the mark of the beast in his image. God has revealed what is to take place in the last days that his people may be prepared to stand against the tempest of opposition and wrath has revealed, past tense. It's not something that, that was left for Parminder and Tess to reveal. He's already revealed it, past tense. Those who have been warned of the events before them are not to sit in calm expectation of the coming storm, comforting themselves that the Lord will shelter His faithful ones in the day of trouble. We are to be as men waiting for their Lord, not an idle expectancy, but an earnest work with unwavering faith. It is no time now to allow our minds to be engrossed with things of minor importance. While men are sleeping, Satan is actively arranging matters so that the Lord's people may not have mercy or justice. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. That, that is one of the things that I wanted to have in place. When we're talking about the Sunday movement, it happens in darkness. Who's in darkness? Well, a lot of people are in darkness. My point is, is who's behind the scenes? Who's forgotten during this history? The papacy is doing its work for Sunday's le legislation, even if we're unwilling to see. For instance, if, if you pass a law in the United States and someone challenges the law and it makes it up to the judicial highest place. What's the highest place? Supreme Court. The Supreme Court can say this law is constitutional or this law is unconstitutional. What religion is the majority of Supreme Court judges? Yeah. Catholics. It's already in place. If, if someone, when the Sunday laws pass, if someone wants to protest it to the Supreme Court, forget about it. Satan's already did his, his preparation. The leaders are concealing the true issue, and many who unite in the movement do not see whether the, current, the undercurrent is tending. You think Trump realizes where he's going with the religious right? No he's, he, he's asked what his favorite Bible verse is, and he doesn't have the ability even just to throw out a John 3.16, okay? He doesn't have a favorite Bible verse. And, and this last religious meeting he was at, he... he uh, he, he, speaking about the Beatitudes, he went directly against it. He says, I get even with, with people. I don't turn the other cheek. I get even, okay? He's, he's, that's who he is. He don't know where this is leading. He has no idea um, where, where this movement is heading. Its professions are mild and apparently Christian, but when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. This is, this is a place where Parminder lies, 
He says, because the United States speaks as a dragon, that proved the United States was a dragon. The United States was never the dragon. The United States has always been the false prophet. But the speaking, the action of the legislative and judicial branch of the United States is going to have the spirit of the dragon because the Sunday law brings with it persecution. That's the spirit of the dragon, is persecution. It is our duty to do all in our part to avert the threatened danger. How can we avert the threatened danger if we no longer believe there's going to be a Sunday law? We should endeavor to disarm prejudice by placing ourselves in a proper light before the people. We should bring before them the real question at issue, thus interposing the most effectual protest against measure, measures to restrict liberty of conscience. Um, on Monday, the Supreme Court ruled against a Seventh-day Adventist um, that had went to court. I, I'm not sure. I, knew, I wanted to remember what company it was. It was like Lowe's. It was some company. And they had argued that they needed to have Sabbath off. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And on Monday, the Supreme Court ruled that it was uh, you know, an unnecessary burden for that company to provide the Seventh-day Sabbath off for that Seventh-day Adventist. We should, br we should bring before them the real question at issue, thus interposing the most effectual protests against measures to re restrict liberty of conscience. We should search the Scriptures and be able to give a reason for our faith. Says the prophet, the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Those who have access to God through Christ have important work before them. Now is the time to lay hold of the arm of strength. The prayer of David should be the prayers of pastors and laymen. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Let the servants of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar, crying, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach. Walgreens. Walgreens. Okay, Walgreens Drugstore. All right, so we're, we're coming to this history. Um, the Sunday Law is the threefold union. And at the threefold union, you're going to see certain things happen, um, one of them being the marvelous working of Satan. Um, but now let's read a passage from Great Controversy 451. And let it be remembered, it is the boast of Rome that she never changes. The principles of Gregory VII and Innocent III are still the principles of the Roman Catholic Church. And had she but the power, she would put them in practice with as much vigor now as in past centuries. Protestants little know what they are doing when they propose to accept the aid of Rome in the work of Sunday exaltation. While they are bent upon the accomplishment of their purpose, Rome is aiming to reestablish her power to recover her lost supremacy. Is she doing it out in the open? No, she's hidden. She's forgotten. But God's word says she's doing this work behind the scenes. Let the principle once be established in the United States that church may employ or control the power of the state, that religious observances may be enforced by secular laws. In short, that the authority of the church and state is to dominate the conscience and the triumph of Rome in this country is assured. God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded, and the Protestant world will learn what the, what the purposes of Rome really are, only when it's too late to escape the snare. She is silently growing in her power, silently growing, hidden, forgotten. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in the legislative halls, in the churches, in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unexpectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground. And this is already being given to her, given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. So I'm saying Rome is just waiting to strike. Okay. Then from Great Controversy 572. A large class, even of those who look upon Romanism with no favor, 
apprehend little danger from her power and influence. Many urge that the intellectual and moral darkness prevailing in the Middle Ages favored the spread of her dogmas, superstitions, and oppression, and that the greater intelligence of modern times, the general, general diffusion of knowledge, and increasing liberality in matters of religion forbid a revival of intolerance and tyranny. The very thought that such a state of things will exist in this enlightened age is ridiculed. It is true that great light, intellectual, moral, and religious is shining upon this generation. In the open pages of God's holy word, light from heaven has been shed upon the world. But it should be remembered that greater, the greater the light bestowed, the greater darkness of those who pervert and reject it. A prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy and would cause them to abhor and shun it. But many are so wise in their own conceit that they feel no need of humbly seeking God that they may be led into the truth. Although priding themselves on their enlightenment, and that's what happened to many of the young people in this movement, the young educated people in this movement. They thought they were too smart to be deceived and they bought into Catholicism without even understanding it. They are ignorant both of the Scriptures and of the power of God, though priding themselves on their enlightenment. They must have some means of quieting their consciences, and they seek that which is least spiritual and humiliating. What they desire is a method of forgetting God, which shall pass as a method of remembering Him. What they desire is a method of forgetting God, which shall pass as a method of remembering Him. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these. It is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world, those who would be saved by their merits and those who would be saved in their sins. Here is the secret of its power. This passage here is one of the most profound passages in the Great Controversy, by the way. It needs to be read over and over again. The things she's saying here, uh, once it starts clicking on you what she's saying uh, about the papacy and its ability to deceive, it's, it's, really, it's really an enlightened piece of um, writing. A day of great intellectual darkness has been shown to be favorable to the success of popery. A gray of, day of great intellectual darkness has been shown to be favorable to the success of popery. It will yet be demonstrated that a day of great intellectual light is equally favorable for its success. success. In past ages, when men were without God's word and without the knowledge of truth, their eyes were blindfolded and thousands were ensnared, not seeing the net spread before their feet. In this generation, there are many whose eyes become dazzled by the glare of human speculation, science falsely so called. They discern not the net and walk into it as readily as if blindfolded. God designed that man's intellectual powers should be held as a gift from his maker and should be employed in the service of truth and righteousness. But when pride and ambition are cherished and men exalt their own theories above the word of God, then intelligence can accomplish greater harm than ignorance. That's what we've seen. Thus, the false science of the 19th century, which undermines faith in the Bible, will prove as successful in preparing the way for the acceptance of the papacy with its pleasing forms as did the withholding of knowledge in, the, in opening the way for its aggrandizement in the Dark Ages. Thus, the false science of the 19th century, which undermines faith in the Bible, and it's the false science of the 19th century that began in the 13th century or 14th century, but it became a public issue in the 19th century, the false science of the papacy, was the doctrine of dispensationalism that got incorporated into the Schofield Bible at the beginning of the 20th century and over a short period of time led the Protestants of the world to accept this dispensational theory of Catholicism and now go to, go to a Protestant Bible bookstore and read their books about the end of the world and their identification of the end of the world is always going to place the Antichrist as a political 
figure. It's the identical dispensationalism of Parminder and Tess, and that's why they placed the end of the world in this political context. It's the same science falsely so-called from the 19th century that was introduced into this movement, that was introduced into the Schofield Bible. Okay, at least one more. I wanted to get to, I got to go just a little bit further, page four. Another point that needs to be in place. Now, I know that even I, we don't need to be spending a great deal of time on Parminder and Tess, okay? And I've been talking about Parminder and Tess all the way through. But I'm trying to make points about them in context of this fourth kingdom down here. The kingdom of the prophets, the priests, and the kings. Because there is a struggle between this movement and the Omega movement. In, and the concepts that lead people into the Omega movement, uh, how it happened, who brought it about, are part of this story. So that's why I'm connecting it with these passages. But this, this next passage is the one that just blows my mind. This is the one that... I, I, you know, I just I can't get away from this one. This is Great Controversy 234-235. Throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumph of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits were created the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience, wholly silenced, they knew no rule, no tie, but that their order and no duty, but that of their order and no duty but to extend its power. The gospel of Christ had enabled its adherents to meet danger and endure suffering, undismayed by cold, hunger, toil, and poverty, to uphold the banner of truth in the face of the rack, the dungeon, and the stake. To combat these forces, Jesuitism inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose to the power of truth all the weapons of deception. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume, vowed to perpetual poverty and humility. It was their studied aim to secure wealth and power to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the reestablishment of the papal supremacy. When Tess stands before her audience and says, the, the Jesuits were open and above board in past history, and they're open and above board in this history, it makes you want to vomit, but what are, what are these so-called Adventists listening to this nonsense for? just blows my mind. She's promoting the Jesuit order, and according to Ellen White, this is the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Next paragraph. When appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and the poor, professing to have renounced the world and bearing the sacred name of Jesus, who went about doing good. But under the blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. Oh, they're open. They were open in the past. They're open now. It was a fundamental principle of the order of the Jesuits that the end justifies the means. That's why not so very long ago, Parminder admitted that he was lying while he was working with us. He said he was lying because he didn't want to cause problems, but they really didn't believe what we were teaching. Okay? He had an end in mind, and anything he needed to do to justify that end was acceptable. Now, he's just out in the open admitting that he bears 
the characteristics of his father, because his father is the father of lies. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable, but commendable when they served the interests of the church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policies of nations. Uh, well, Parminder shaped the policies of developing a church and wrote baptismal vows that he denies later that he wrote, but he did write. He was there at the head of the work, guiding and directing. They became servants to act as spies upon their masters. They established colleges for the sons of princes and nobles and schools for the common people, and the children of Protestant parents, parents were drawn into the observance of popish rites. Schools were their point of target, yes. That one part where it says they became servants to act as spies upon their masters, that's what Parminder had his minions do. Yes. Yes, what was going on here, he yes. had spies here. Mm -hmm. Yes. And not just spying, they were stealing stuff. They were, they were destroying some of the presentations of the pastor that were, would speak against their positions. We can't find them anymore. They're just gone. All the outward pomp and display of the Romish worship was brought to bear to confuse the mind and dazzle and captivate the imagination, and thus the liberty for which the fathers had toiled and bled was betrayed by the sons. The Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe, and wherever they went, they followed, there followed a revival of popery. To give them greater power, a bull was issued reestablishing the Inquisition. Notwithstanding the general abhorrence with which it was regarded even in Catholic countries, this terrible tribunal was again set up by popish rulers, and atrocities too terrible to bear the light of day were repeated in its secret dungeons. In many countries, thousands upon thousands of the very flower of the nation, the purest and noblest, the most intelligent and highly educated, pious and devoted pastors, industrious and patriotic citizens, brilliant scholars, talented artists, skillful artisans were slain or forced to flee to other lands. Such were the means which Rome had invoked to quench the light of the Reformation, to withdraw men from the Bible, and to restore the ignorance and superstition of the Dark Ages. But under God's blessing and labors of those noble men whom he had raised up to succeed Luther, Protestantism was not overthrown. Not to the favor or arms of princes was it to owe its strength. The smallest countries, the humblest and least powerful nations became its strongholds. It was little Geneva in the midst of mighty foes plotting her destruction. It was Holland on the sandbanks by the northern sea wrestling against the tyranny of Spain, then the greatest and most opulent of kingdoms. It was bleak, sterile Sweden that gained victories for the Reformation. And here we are in this classroom today with two, four, six, seven people. Just so everyone will know, uh, I recently, if I ever did know it, I forgot it. I uh, was examining the, um, uh, the appendix to the Great Controversy, and there, although there are some things in that appendix that, that disgust me, because of those who put their dirty fingers in it, there are some some good some good information, and one of them is they have the vow of the Jesuits. So if you want to go look it up, you have it right there at your fingertips. In right the Great Controversy. In the Great Controversy appendix. Okay, I when I was putting these notes together this morning, I thought I'm going to go online and get the the Jesuit oath and put it in these, and I never got time to. So. So if you got if you you should have if you're watching this the great controversy look at the appendix appendix and look at the Jesuit oath and then ask yourself how is it that Parminder and Tess can uplift an order that uses that oath in order to become part of that that work and how is it that they can celebrate that the current pope is the first Jesuit Pope. And how is it, if you're listening to them, that you're listening to them? 
wake up, you're about to die. So I, I didn't get through as far as I wanted, but I'll do it in the next presentation. There's still, still some of these concepts that need to be put in place. And we need to look at Revelation 17 also. And then we'll go more specifically to these lines. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we could say that this movement was hijacked by Jesuits, but I prefer to think that this movement was purged by your providential leading, that you recognize a great crisis is coming, and that because of your love for us that are still here, though few in number, on the walls of Zion, that you knew that we needed to be a pure group of people in order to stand up against this coming crisis. And so we thank you for what's taken place, even though it has had a, a large consequence, a painful consequence among many of us. Uh, we thank you that you are opening the light of Daniel 11 once again at the end of this movement as you did at the beginning. Uh, we thank you that uh, this message now is sounding around the world. We ask a blessing upon it wherever it may go. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.